Okay. Uh, today we uh, start uh, introducing a, a new material, uh, which is again a ceramic and is uh, most often used as a ceramic matrix composite. And uh, this is cement. And uh, uh, cement, uh, as you can see from the uh, slide to the right, is uh, is constituted by a number of uh, different materials, but is basically based on calcium carbonate. That's the you can uh, see that say that, and it's not it's quite fair. With some clay, therefore some aluminum silicates. So you have uh, basically calcium uh, aluminum uh, in in an oxide form. Um, silica and some uh, iron. Um, it is uh, very difficult to uh, give a precise structure of uh, cement. In uh, practical terms, uh, this has been the first material which has been uh, designed in the reverse way in the sense that um, we introduced a number of different materials, we mixed them, we cooked them, we started to cook them. We have uh, the, the Portland process basically is uh, con consist in the fact of uh, putting in an oven, in a descending oven, so you have some slow, you cook at some uh, temperature and you produce this, this, this kind of clinker uh, where you have uh, a number of uh, components uh, uh, so calcium silicates uh, uh, tricalcic aluminate ferritic tetracalcic aluminate and in practical terms what um, you need to be sure is that um, you don't need to have too much calcium oxide, therefore lime, basically. You don't need to have uh, too much lime because otherwise uh, the material is it's going to be very sensitive to the weather because uh, calcium salts, um, calcium sulfate, which is uh, gypsum or chalk, and uh, calcium carbonate, which is calcar, uh, are basically as you may know, considerably sensitive to weather. And this is a material which is going to be applied uh, in uh, open air for construction. Therefore, it's supposed to be exposed to weather. Uh, next time, I'm going to try to uh, elucidate a little bit what uh, is required by uh, um, this uh, uh, resistance to weather in terms of resistance of the weather and uh, it is also important to remember that uh, cement is used usually with some aggregates so some uh, some harder bits in, in a sense like stones or the gravel which are inserted in, uh, in cement you can say easily that already sand it's harder than calcar, so um, and it's more compact, can be compacted in a better way. Um, but you introduce aggregates, and you usually use it in the form of reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete was started at the end of the 19th century. A person which is important in, in this sense is Hennebeek, which was a French engineer, which has a bit, little bit the same role that Eiffel has got for uh, the use of wrought iron uh, to, in construction. And then Hennebeek has the same uh, role for, um, for uh, cement, for the use of concrete and the use of reinforced concrete in particular. Reinforced concrete, therefore, with steel bars. Uh, it, 
they started basically with wrought iron bars, so basically there was some silica in their um, iron, but in reality the iron alloys, but in reality then they had a more pure uh, carbon uh, equally ferritic steel uh, to put as bars uh, thermally into, uh, into concrete. And so you have reinforced concrete. Well, it's not, uh, it's not right to say reinforced cement. Every, everyone says reinforced cement. In reality, it is reinforced concrete because obviously you, um, you don't put cement with basically no sand, or little sand, or no gravel and so on. And you put the steel bars inside because uh, the material wouldn't be able to be withstand the weight of steel bars. So it is reinforced concrete. Why reinforced concrete has got a so large success? Here to the left, you can see that um, we have a number of materials. Some materials are classified as exotic. Uh, you may um, understand that this is, again, a, a diagram from Ashby, from the Ashby School. And um, you can see that there, we have a number of materials. And uh, here we have the cost of materials which is very low for concrete. Concrete is on the lowest end because uh, um, it has some uh, um, flexibility in terms of introduction of materials. In concrete, you can do things which you are not able to do with glass. For example, in glass, you are a bit um, limited in the terms of, for example, you don't want the glass crystallizes. And therefore, you cannot introduce some substances into glass, which would decrease its weight and its cost. Um, you cannot make it very porous because it would be a problem. In concrete, it isn't a big problem. Well, of course, having said that, I wouldn't say that concrete is eternal. Concrete has its own duration. Uh, bricks cost more timber. We call timber wood when it's used in construction. Timber is more expensive, but it lasts more. We found uh, in, uh, in Rome, in the excavation done, done for the, uh, the underground, recently we found some uh, timber manufacts, uh, which uh, uh, are there since 2000 years or so. And uh, uh, you can uh, be pretty sure that we will not found, find any concrete in 2000 years time. But apart from this time limitation, it is cheap. And it, it's made also cheaper by the fact that you can introduce a number of possible waste into concrete also some some strange or uh, or nasty uh, waste we can introduce it in the concrete and it works asphalt has the same characteristic of concrete being able to embed any kind of waste and uh, this would reduce further the cost of concrete you can easily see that another uh, classes of materials where, where that, which are not structural, but they are important anyway, are the uh, fuels, oil and coal. Apart from all considerations of sustainability, we can easily say that we carry on using oil, using coal, using, using any kind of um, oil extracted fuels because they are very cheap. And uh, uh, this is a fact which is still important. Uh, if you, we carry on with this evaluation, we can see that, well, this is a, a um, scheme for the uh, 
proven basically for the production of uh, clinker. Clinker is the um, raw material which we are able to um, apply to pour in order to make some structure because basically uh, there are some ceramic materials like bricks which you basically cook in molds and they are ready but of course uh, you may well understand that uh, bricks are small and to make a house you need lots of bricks and you cook them one by one although of course there are some ways of uh, putting a very large number of molds uh, uh, for the for bricks in, in large uh, oven or furnaces and and so you are able to um, to make the product but to increase the rate of production but apart from that you cannot compare with uh, clinker with uh, concrete where basically you what you do you you pour down into a box like structure basically uh, the whole of it where um, bar steel bars are already there and you are able to make you have this uh, kind of uh, one time mold which is made with usually with wood in fact, you can see the uh, trace of wood uh, beams when you when you um, when you see the uh, freshly done um, concrete wall. So the uh, steel bars are already there, and we pour down uh, the cement concrete, so cement with aggregates, and. Uh, um, we need we need to leave it to uh, dry for some time and after that it will be ready so there are um, i don't go into details because you you may understand our time is always uh, tight but uh, you may be interested to know that potent cement is divided into different classes according to calcium oxide content Silicic modulus, which is the ratio between silica and the two oxides, the, the aluminum oxide and iron oxide, or aluminum modulus, which is another um, another um, ratio between the aluminum oxide and iron oxide. It is important not to have too much magnesium with, uh, into um, cement into concrete because uh, it tends to be more deformable and uh, it doesn't withstand too much high temperature so uh, magnesium needs to be limited this might be not obvious because aluminum and magnesium are often uh, together in a number of rocks etc so in extractive terms it might not be obvious so um it costs very little. It, uh, um, there is a relation here. We have two other graphs from uh, Ashby. And basically, uh, you can see that uh, concrete uh, compares with natural materials. And it's defined, it's again a non technical ceramics. So uh, these are ceramics which are produced in bulk, like uh, clay for bricks, etc. They are not technical, so not produced in small pieces with very specific properties, like, for example, the resistance to, to wear, to abrasion, and the biomedical use. Um, some sort of um, ceramics also, or non-technical ceramics, are used also in biomedical uh, field some sort even on, of uh, cement-like materials, but uh, in general terms, it's intended as a non-technical ceramic. It is compared with natural materials because uh, reinforced concrete 
came out uh, because uh, not of the replacement of bricks, as, as we could think. Uh, in reality, uh, it, it has a huge effect on contraction because with bricks, we are limited uh, and the height of the construction uh, is around 20 meters. You wouldn't be very safe of baking a structure by stones and brick and go beyond the 20 meters. But uh, all right, it's already a lot, quite a lot. And it needs to be very uh, thick in terms of uh, dimensions of the walls. So uh, very stiff because of uh, its shape. Let's think of uh, the Colosseum. We can, we can do, of course. It's already there, it's still there because it, it wasn't made in concrete, it was made in um, bricks and stones. Um, uh, it cannot go much beyond the height of the, the Colosseum with this kind of structure. Of course, you can make other kind, kind of structures. Um, like uh, um, clock towers and so on, uh, but in general terms, uh, you are limited in having large constructions uh, in, uh, without the use of concrete or reinforced concrete. In, in practical terms, uh, what uh, pushed the um, pushed the concrete was not a substitution with uh, with bricks for bricks it was not being a substitute for bricks which uh, in uh, practical terms is. Um, but the uh, replacement of uh, uh, timber, basically uh, wood was used a lot in construction, especially to make roof and roof structures, etc. Uh, but uh, this generated a number of problems, including uh, fire, getting fire to fire. And uh, in fact, um, the, the touching centers of uh, the Mediterranean. That's I mean, it was French and it was, it was meaning that, that we don't want to have any more fire in the construction. Uh, and therefore, uh, reinforced concrete walls developed. Uh, in terms of Young's modulus, uh, which again is measured in compression, because these materials work into compression, what we find out is that we have very good results with kind of isotropic material. It's not used in, um, of, in uh, tension. Normal concrete is not used in tension because of the development of cracks and you hardly see any, you can do some small columns in a sort of columns in cement, in concrete, with or not without uh, steel reinforcement, but very small um, columns, for example, for, for balconies. But if uh, you just go a little bit in terms of dimension, you would need definitely having a, a reinforcement, a steel bars reinforcement. Uh, so this is the big limitation. It has no tension, not resistant tension, because it tends, it tends to... Uh, it has some stiffness in tension, but it's not able to be extended. So it doesn't uh, withstand any strain, basically any and this is a characteristic for most ceramics that they are not able to be used in tension. If they are not com ceramic composites, because uh, reinforced concrete is a ceramic matrix composite. So the matrix, the bulk is ceramic, but there is something else which is not. Which is uh, which are uh, steel bars. Uh, then the comparison is uh, in uh, with Foams, so there is a com comparison with foams, which is interesting. Again, uh, we had the talk just a little bit about foams. Well, foams are very important in a number of industries and in construction industry because they are basically 
empty materials uh, with uh, cell, cellular structures. So they weigh very little, like styrofoam, polystyrene, expanded polystyrene. But in practical terms, uh, of course, their strength is much more limited than the one for uh, light. Usually not able to withstand the weight of a building. Although attempts in building with foam structures have been done for small, um, or small uh, rooms or uh, something like that, you can use not only for uh, plating uh, panels, but also in some cases for structural panels, some sandwich panels, which are internally made with the foam, which is included uh, into uh, the, um, the whole of the structure made with two panels one per side or more. Uh, panels which can be done, for example, with um, fiberglass. We are going to talk about composites, uh, uh, polymer fiber composites in the last part. But... Okay, uh, so uh, going further, you can see that uh, cement has been used for a long, long time before developing the concrete. So basically, uh, cement was used as a binder, so as some, something that was supposed to bind the structure, so to keep the structure together. So basically, you can have the ceramic binders, which are aerial, so where they can harden uh, only in air. They just need air to harden, like such a lime. You start from calcium oxide, so lime, or slaked lime, which is calcium oxide with a further, which is hydrated. So ba basically, you have a further water, water molecule, which is linked with calcium oxide, and you get the calcium hydroxide or gypsum. So calcium sulfate, normally dehydrated. You might have monohydrated or even more. Even I get with more than two molecules, but the most um, common version, I would say, is uh, with um, water molecules. Or, or hydraulic, which need to be immersed in water to make something that is workable. So, um, this time I'm not sure I will go into that with workability because, uh, of course, uh, you need uh, some more uh, information before that. Um, what is sure about uh, cement is that you have this, uh, um, this uh, ratio between uh, uh, water and cement, the, the WC ratio, which gives you the uh, the sense of its workability. So you may put more or less water depending on the strength you want. And of course, the strong it is, the less workable it is as well, because you need, as always with molds, the problem is if you want to make a concrete wall, you need to fill the mold. And you need to fill the mold without applying any pressure. You need to, you need to pour in the mold. So you, you can compress it in some cases, uh, but uh, the most, most of the effect which is given um, by uh, concrete is this, its capability to uh, self-assemble self in a sense into, into the mold, to pour into the mold order to offer the right amount of porosity. Uh, this depends also on the amount of aggregates you put. And of course, the more cement, this is tricky because the more cement you put, the more the material is expensive because water is less expensive than, than uh, cement after all, uh, especially the industrial water which you use for cement. And so basically, 
there is a good compromise between uh, these three factors, strength, workability, and cost. Uh, in uh, chemical uh, sense, of course, uh, there is a, a, we know that there is a, an ideal water cement ratio because uh, um, what happens in practice is that you, you have uh, this port, the portal cement, you may, can make a distinction between a portal cement, which is uh, basically from uh, rocks which have no volcanic origin, and porcelanic big binder, which has instead some uh, volcanic origin uh, rocks like uh, by, by lava and uh, by some yeah, the upper masses are. And in practical terms, um, there are different categories with different uh, um, blends of and um, porcelanic binder. There is also something in between. So it's not just obtained by And sand minerals, and uh, usually you twist uh, and all the materials also. Uh, you have make a distinction between uh, cement paste. Cement paste is basically something that it's just used for as a binder, which was the original use for uh, cement. For lime, starting from lime, you get to uh, cement, you add something else add some sand and you get a kind of paste which is able to stick in between bricks, for example. Uh, then you pass to cement slurry, which uh, is, uh, includes an, a larger amount of sand, uh, which is able to make it into something structural. The difference, as always, is that something structural is able to withstand the weight on its own, whilst the binder is not able to withstand the weight. Um, it's just able to uh, bind to two structures, like two bricks. Um, then concrete with aggregates. You have to put more than sand, you put also graven stones, and small stones, etc. And uh, Anything else you can you have a number of possibilities now, now for concrete. You can also put some uh, glass, uh, small glass pieces increasing, uh, so not really for some quartz again. So it, it, it depends really what uh, you want to do with the, um, concrete and the kind of mechanical properties you want to. Do. Reinforced concrete with steel bars. Uh, coming back to the um, to, uh, water cement ratio, water cement ratio, um, the ideal one is uh, 0 0.42. 0 .42. In reality, uh, you never use a water cement um, that high, that low, because uh, a, um, Water cement that low means that you, you are supposing one thing which is never true. Uh, that uh, water stays all there, cold water stays there. So you have no evaporation, no water loss by other means, also by uh, in, inaccurate mixing, because uh, it's, you can understand that it's uh, much difficult to uh, lose a, a part of your concrete than losing water. Water can, can spill for something else or in, in some, for some reason. So you usually take this 0 0.42 as the minimum uh, water to cement ratio. If everything goes well, if you don't cure because there is the, this process which is called cure. And it's, it's important to know, know that because 
it's a word which is used in material science and not only in material science, I would say, because um, uh, curing means that you have this process of drying and hardening by drying. And um, it might be fast, for example, in an epoxy uh, resin, you have the B component epoxy resin, and when you put the second component, the hardener, the resin becomes harder in a few minutes, two hours. Well, here it can take up to a month in uh, concrete to become harder. And this is done, you can, you can easily understand that you are going to lose some water that month, that's why the water to cement ratio is uh, um, higher than uh, 0.42. Uh, because, also because um, a typical environment for curing is um, in, in the sun, uh, or in any case in a quite high uh, moisture environment. So in practical terms, uh, you have this kind of, uh, of situation that uh, you form this kind of gel, which is a gel with um, calcium silicate um, and uh, hydrated calcium silicates, basically, which are the main two components, which form this kind of gel. A gel in, is, uh, uh, in material science terms, is something that includes water in a, a stable form, so water that you are not likely to lose if the conditions stay the same. <laughs> and so it is in between a solid and a liquid, able to flow into some conditions, but in the case of concrete, is normally stable. So you start from an amount of water and an amount of uh, cement, and uh, you, um, you then end, end up with uh, some empty pores, so pores which basically uh, not include water, and uh, you have then water which is kept into capillary pores, water stays in between the, um, the cement and other, another one stays into uh, the gel. Then you have some uh, products which are hydrated, uh, which might be uh, lime, which might be gypsum, which might be uh, alumina and so on, and silica. And, uh, um, Then a part which is not hydrated. Uh, this, is, this gives you an idea. Of course, uh, they are not layered like that. They are all together, but it gives you an idea of the relative proportion. In practical terms, uh, you have uh, a, the mo most part of cement is made with this CSH gel. And this is very interesting that cement is a sort of a gel because uh, um, it's interesting and also creates lots of problems on the other side because you need to be sure that it flows when you need it and that it's completely cured then so it's harder when the wall is going to be ready to, to build upon it. So basically, you keep the wall into your mold for Time. The, the, um, the standards suggest 28 days for uh, verifying, verifying the compression strength. We are going to see that uh, next time. Uh, of course, you need to verify the compression strengths until you release your wall for use. And uh, well, this is very um, basic what I what I am saying, but. Um, you understand that it's critical the way this gel works at the beginning and it's able to flow into the mold. And so it depends on the behavior it has. Because since the 
in between a solid and a liquid, we can define a gel as a fluid. And uh, fluid means that it flows, but it doesn't flow as a liquid. It flows as something in between a liquid and a solid. We are going to call the most uh, liquids, most uh, substances that we define liquids in our common language as Newtonian fluids. And we are going to, to talk about that in a minute. So basically, uh, you may remember that uh, you call that difficulty to flow uh, viscosity. So we need to control not only the viscosity of um, cement, but also the um, behavior. So in which sense it departs from the idea Newtonian again, behavior called a liquid. The CSH gel have, have had also some uh, Use, especially in the last few years, there's been some research developments. As always, uh, I, I try to introduce you to a number of teams into material science. There are countless teams of research in material science. But you can make the, some hierarchized CSH gel. Hierarchized uh, CSH gel means that you are able to uh, withstand the propagation of uh, cracks. And you are able to withstand that propagation to allow cracks not to open, not to reach the uh, unstable level of unstable crack propagation. You may remember um, Griffith's theorem. So you don't want uh, the crack to reach an unstable crack uh, propagation energy for an unstable crack propagation and uh, so to uh, to exceed the stress intensity factor in nature uh, they are able to to do that because uh, materials in nature are made in hierarchized uh, structure so along hierarchic level they grow in the case, for example, natural fibers, you start from nanofibers, microfibers, and you go up to the macrofiber, which is the one you really see and use. And uh, um, another thing which is important is that this gel instead uh, is not able to, to do uh, this kind of work in many cement because basically crack propagates quite easily. See the problem we have in construction is uh, due exactly to that, exactly to the fact that it works very well in fixed mold, it's able to be uh, dual, and therefore we are able to make even large structures. Um, but uh, um, as a matter of fact, it, after a, a, a while, it tends to be uh, prone to propagation of cracks. Um, this uh, phenomenon in uh, nature uh, of the uh, impossibility to reach an unstable crack propagation was defined as tensegrity by, by the twins of uh, which was uh, one of the first to investigate uh, um, the to investigate the behavior of natural materials. As uh, I was, uh, I have remember a number of times also in Ashby diagrams, natural materials and synthetic materials are all together uh, pertaining to the same problem, the same vision. Um, but Mr. Fuller realized that the problem was uh, that uh, natural structures, by, by their cellular geometry are able to be always in tension because uh, uh, the CSH gel which constitutes basically uh, salmon uh, can in many cases be just compressed 
is not in tension uh, in any part of it. Uh, Why is in nature, uh, since the structure has got the spiral um, arrangement, and uh, uh, you can easily see that uh, if a crack propagates, then the crack itself is covered by some, by some other um, material, which is in uh, some, some other matter, which uh, um, is arranged into a spiralic form shape uh, with respect to it. So in practice, the crack doesn't propagate. And uh, that's why it, it, it defined as tensegrity. So the integrity given by the fact of being always in tension. Of course, I have no time to explain that into depth because uh, there are a number of uh, questions that arises about that. Um, instead, in uh, cement, we are confronted to severe uh, confrontation more than a, a, a struggle um, in uh, to the fact that uh, we need to cope with viscosity. We need to cope with the viscosity. Uh, you define, so if you want something to flow, you apply a shear force. So you have this, uh, you remember that the forces are tension, compression, and torsion. Uh, if you want something to flow, for example, in a, in a pipe, in a tube, uh, you apply a shear force uh, to your um, line, I would say, of fluid, which has got H uh, thickness. Um, to simplify things, and also because it's the, the most common way to do that, uh, you would suppose that the velocity is constant and the section area as well, because you Pipe and you know it's the next dimension. And you, there is a coefficient, a coefficient which links the force you have to apply with these uh, uh, geometrical uh, parameters and the velocity. And therefore, you, um, you can call that mu, uh, which is the m, the big m, and uh, the Dynamic unit, uh, this is called dynamic viscosity because it's uh, the viscosity of something that moves, therefore, it's a uh, dynamic. Um, but it, uh, um, it moves uh, with uh, in general terms. Then you have a kinematic uh, viscosity. Uh, which is nu, and which is the ratio between mu and rho. Rho is the uh, Greek R and it's uh, density, the science density. And because um, in general terms, you just need the, um, uh, the mu because uh, the viscosity, the absolute viscosity, because you viscosity depends on the type of fluid you have type of blend, you make a blend, and you, this blend has got some viscosity. Of course, also water has got a viscosity, and we know perfectly the viscosity of water, as you may imagine, and, um, and also the relation between the viscosity of water and the density of water. You may remember that the density of water the highest density of water is at 4 degrees Celsius. Um, kinematic viscosity uh, considers the local, let's say, gravitational forces. Uh, so, the, of course, if it weighs more, the material flows less, whatever its viscosity, this is true, if the viscosity stays the same, Say the same if, uh, if you increase the density. Uh, this is important because, uh, uh, for example, introducing aggregates, if you imagine introducing uh, uh, larger aggregates, uh, uh, they are more compact and you may find that um, you have uh, a lower. 
uh, viscosity. So uh, if you uh, increase, you might increase uh, the density with aggregates, uh, considering that aggregates are uh, full stones, but you might have also polar stones, like uh, that the Atomensius uh, are stones. And in that case, new. Uh, it's increased because the density is reduced. So the, this is a compromise between uh, um, between these two factors. Uh, and uh, um, having said that, you have a different situation. You have a kind of um, laminar flow. So you may you may imagine that in your uh, tube you have some lamina which uh, flow parallel, in a parallel way with each other. And you have a high, in cases of high viscosity, the lamina are not parallel to each other, but they flow better in some. You have a different velocity profile in a sense. You have the much lower, you have also the effect. Wall, which means also another thing that uh, in general terms uh, you would imagine that you get more uh, if you want to get more water uh, since water has a low viscosity you may imagine that you make a larger tube and you have more water uh, if the viscosity is high Making a larger tube might create a number of problems in variation of uh, flow, which in the end doesn't mean that you, don't, you, you would always get more flow with a larger tube, but you are not able to control your flow, uh, which, which is a problem. If you have to fill, if you have to fill a mold, say. To making uh, cement, uh, not be able to control that process. Okay, and uh, mm, this is a uh, scale. Well, the, the, the uh, unit for viscosity, which is normally used, is the uh, centipoise. The centipoise, because uh, it, it was a, a fortunate uh, unit because it's around the viscosity of water at the room temperature. So around 20 degrees, um, water has a viscosity of one centimeter. Uh, of course, uh, at the room temperature and also at the room pressure. Um, in other cases, uh, you have uh, um, liquids, steel liquids, uh, which are less um, viscous than water, but they are just a few of them, like uh, as in, in some cases, some alcohols, and uh, uh, of course, gases, what is over viscosity. Uh, but uh, in general terms, most liquids have got higher viscosity than water and tends to become, in some cases, uh, uh, fluids, non-Newtonian fluids. You can get the non-Newtonian behavior. This has a sort of relation with viscosity. You are more likely to have non-Newtonian uh, fluids with Viscosity, although there is not a precise relation, but there is a sort of trend. A sort of trend. And non-Newtonian non fluids, uh, in very simple terms, is the fluid that doesn't take the shape of the container. Uh, in good water, uh, you can easily see that even with oil. Can easily see that if you pour water or oil in the bottom, it takes the shape of the bottom without you having to push it. 
uh, with other fluids like honey or ketchup, it's already a bit of a problem. In the case that you pack the honey over the ketchup, you want obviously, if you have to sell it, you want to, to um, fill the jar or the bottle. Um, this might be a problem. And in the case of the mold, in the case of sanity, you want to fill the mold. And uh, uh, this is even uh, more difficult. Uh, you can see that most of the, uh, this is not the case, this is not the case, that most of the, the uh, fluids that are reported on this scale are uh, fluids, are alimentary fluids, like honey, maple syrup, or chocolate syrup, and so on. Um, because in reality, rheology, which is the science that studies uh, the flow of liquids and fluids, uh, are a science, a branch of the physics uh, that is used into uh, chemistry. So um, this is the situation with water. With water, you can see a a trend which is true for all liquids, basically, so that the viscosity goes down in, with temperature, which you can explain this in, in quite reasonable uh, ways by the fact that the, the atoms have and therefore are more prone to. Uh, This is something that uh, has the drowning movements uh, in process. This is something that I want to keep in mind. Um, but since I want to keep that course quite uh, smooth and easy to, to get to this end, because you can see that the, the themes are very different from each other, I will try to cover the whole of material science. Um, we can say that, um, of course, there is an effect with uh, density. Uh, there is an effect with density, which is considered not by absolute uh, viscosity, like this one, by, by, but by kinematic uh, viscosity. And uh, kinematic viscosity, this is the dynamic viscosity again. You can see that uh, when you have a water ethanol mixture, for example, one thing which is interesting is that uh, even if, uh, even if the um, even if the two um, liquids are miscible, completely miscible, like like it is the case for water and ethanol, what happens in practice is that um, you have the highest viscosity at around half and half. Water out pattern. This is not always, don't take it as a rule because, in, in cases that viscosity is very different between the two, you might have a uh, um, very different situation. But that the viscosity of a blend is higher than the viscosity of the pure liquids is something which you, you, can, which you can take quite, quite as granted. Uh, this is the density of water. Again, you can see that the density of water goes up at 40 degrees, uh, 4 degrees, sorry, 4 degrees Celsius. Uh, and uh, uh, up to 1. So that's the density to which we refer on the density of all the, the materials. For example, well, uh, cement is usually 3.15. The one we use, the concrete, is level 3.15 because there is some amount of water, which has density one. Uh, so you might easily say that the density of the concrete we are using, taking away steel bars, let's consider concrete, it's around 2.5. It's, it's a fair assumption. Uh, one of the important things also in material science is being able to orient between materials and taking some. Uh, assumptions, which might not be uh, excellent for theoretical physics, physicians, but in, in this 
is at mineral sense it, it's important uh, on the practical point of functions like that. So in practical terms, uh, the dynamic mass viscosity is also considered as um, Pascal per second. In this case, it was represented as milli Pascal per second. But anyway, uh, the uh, international system unit is Pascals per second. So uh, what happens with oil, for example? With oil, we have, you have the same situation. You have the density, which is in black, which goes down. Of course, it gives you the impression of it's sort of linear. It's sort of linear. Whilst the uh, viscosity is not. Viscosity goes considerably down with temperature. Uh, at least in, on a linear scale, and uh, um, you can easily imagine that in some cases uh, uh, you might need to change the temperature at which uh, the um, at which the fluid um, is made flowing. Only only a few degrees of difference might uh, impede the clogging of the material of the That's that's might be very important in this case. Um, let's let's think, for example, the variation of evaporation between um, between gasoline and uh, diesel. Uh, you might you might see that um, it depends also on the evaporation that in turn uh, works into a different. So um, we were saying that we want to measure the flow and to measure the flow, which is a, an important operation in material science is, uh, um, this is done, uh, we need the viscosity, we need the density. And in fact, you can rewrite that uh, by using the new, by using the kinematic density, because in practice you have uh, E, Per V, so the volume of your fluid, the diameter of the tube, and uh, kinematic viscosity divided by kinematic viscosity, or um, divided by density and divided by density. This is called the Reynolds number, and the Reynolds number gives you an idea of how the um, flow can be laminar if the Reynolds number is low or turbulent, so you, you, you might not be able to control how much flow you have in the tube. And uh, uh, circular tube means, can mean the tube, for example, of the, that brings our uh, cement, our clinker into the mold, or can be the flow, for example, a plastic that needs to be Inject into a mold of a 3D, um, a 3D wire, uh, which needs to be uh, molten into a nozzle to form the object we want. You know how uh, 3D printing works. So basically, we have this kind of wire, wire or material which is molten and penetrates from a nozzle and. Um, able to be controlled. You can understand that it's not just a software question. Uh, you decide that you want to make that shape by 3D printing. Then the polymer or the blend between polymer and ceramic that goes up from the nozzle needs to be able to uh, comply to regulate its velocity in order to make the object move. So, um, for concrete, make some uh, rough calculation. I was uh, considering here some rough calculation. If you, you were, you were saying, we were saying that a rough assumption uh, can be that concrete is around 2.5 uh, um, with respect, uh, considering water. Uh, water density is 0.1 is 
for concrete so it's about the one for glass um, we consider a large tube let's consider one of the tubes uh, uh, which uh, lead we are usually using in construction, they are not very small tubes. A diameter of 0.2 meters or 20 centimeters can, can be reasonable. Of course, you need a uh, flow rate, a flow rate because uh, um, this, is, this is very critical because of what we, we want. Because there is another, another problem in which we need to consider. Uh, it is not a very good conductor of concrete. And so in practice, it starts to, to um, solidify, especially if you have a large mold, it starts to solidify in some parts and it might be still flowing from another, another uh, side. So we need to be reasonably fast to do that. Don't have these problems with conductive materials. In the, say, if you want to cast uh, cast iron, produce a piece in cast iron, you can be very fast. There's no reality. It doesn't make very much difference the, the, uh, what, what you do. Well, I don't want to say that you not, don't need to do it. Don't take ages to do that. But in reality, you are less pressed. Because the material tends to uh, be quite uh, uniform in terms of temperature. More than it does not. Um, so, in concrete, the conclusion of that is the velocity uh, is the one that is indicated by this flow rate. Reynolds number is around, it's less than 100 anyway. So, you have a lam laminar flow. In practical terms, you have a uh, stagnant flow in that case so it tends to be stagnating so it tends to be quite it tends to be very slow close to stagnating you are familiar to the notion of the stagnating of water in the case we don't see water flowing uh, this is the case in any river for example in a river in a flat like uh, the Italy in Rome, you don't see the water flowing, but it is, it is flowing towards the sea. And it is, it is quite stagnant. In some cases, you might have also this over uh, seven, it might be very slow. We need to put a limit into that because in the end, you might have trouble in the temperature differences inside the, uh, uh, the system. Even, even a few degrees of temperature difference might. might um, so um, then you have a laminar flow, and then you going up, you have a transition flow or a turbulent flow. A turbulent flow, you have basically you have a wave of wave of uh, made of different streams, which are intersecting between them. And of course, in the case of we are going to discuss a little bit, I hope, about injection molding of objects because it's uh, still the cheap. And you can see that in that case, uh, temperature pressures and times are very important. Um, and and the, the difference in plastics is that you are able to modify substantially your composition, the composition of your plastics, in order to um, modify as well the, the viscosity and that for the flow, which you are not very much able to do in concrete and concrete there isn't much it's more like uh, you can um, you can modify a little bit of the ratio between plus and so on but the differences are not as large as in newtonians so new, a newtonian fluid uh, um, fills its uh, um, Container without any need for pressure or anything. So this applies to uh, not only to water but to fluid. Milk, most water emulsions like milk applies to oil, to alcohol, vinegar, and so on. 
even if they have different viscosity, they, they are still um, plutonium fluids. And uh, plutonium fluids fill the, um, fill the uh, container, the jar, the bottle, uh, in any, any situation. Uh, with no time effect, basically, uh, if you have to fill, uh, if you have been to a plant where they fill water bottle, mineral water bottle, the only requirement is to do as fast as possible because uh, so you, they, they build the mechanical system in order to fill the water uh, uh, because it doesn't any effect on the water quality because it's because it stays the same, it stays the same whatever uh, velocity you will feel the, the, feel the bottle. So it's preferable in terms of production, it's preferable to feel the higher, highest possible uh, velocity comparatively with it. Um, in other cases, you have a number of different situations. You have the plastic fluids. Plastic fluids means that they normally wouldn't move, wouldn't flow unless you put Given course, which is called by similarity with mechanical uh, tests, is called the field. So once you exceed the field, you remember that when you exceed the field, field in force, then the, um, then the material becomes plastic in the mechanical test. Here, the material starts to flow. This is typical, for example, for mayonnaise say when when you you apply a force on your mayonnaise bottle or your mayonnaise tap uh, then uh, or you, you squeeze it so when you squeeze something uh, that, that means that it's a uh, plastic fluid and it means that force or uh, there are two opposite situations two couple of opposite situations the fluid might decrease its viscosity if you apply a higher if you apply your force at a, a higher velocity so when you apply your force faster the flow is again so in uh, paints or ketchup or starch basically you um, it depends how um, how fast you, you, you apply your force, and this it, this allows the flow to the flow to be easier. There is also the opposite situation, uh, in especially in sand suspension, that at a certain moment, if you apply everything to uh, anything too fast, the velocity. Uh, is too high, then you get to a higher viscosity. And then at a certain point, the flow stops. So uh, you have another, then you have another couple of opposite situation, the tixotropic behavior. Here we deal with a kind of, uh, say, a fatigue force. So you apply a constant force, a constant force up and down for at a certain point, as the viscosity decreases and the material flows. This is the typical behavior of whipped cream, for example. You shake the whipped cream at a certain point, you shake an amount of pencil at a certain point, goes, goes out, or jam, uh, or blood. Blood, for example, the so called miracle of St. January in Naples is, uh, well, you can be liver or for blood, but blood. Um, so often that if you shake the, the pot, then after, after a while, blood uh, goes, goes out and uh, melts in a sense, but in reality, it starts flowing um, because it wasn't solid, it starts flowing. But in, in, apart from the um, anecdote, uh, the, the question is that blood is uh, assigned like that in order to be able to reach the solar um, gains of the, uh, 
more capillary veins that you have at the extremities of your bone. Those, uh, in reality, you have a pump, actually. And um, from the pump, it goes into larger tubes than smaller and smaller tubes. Uh, this, uh, if it had uh, any was water, uh, at a certain point, uh, having always the same uh, viscosity, um, it, would, uh, it would clog somewhere. Uh, instead, in this case, uh, it would have more difficulty because the effect of the, 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 uh, the diameter of the tube would have been uh, so you would need a higher force to penetrate the, the smaller vein. Instead, in that way, since it is this probably the force applied by the heart is about the same, it can be increased or decreased, but in some situations, but the force stays the same for a long time. And since the blood is dixotropic, uh, and the heart beats at a fast rate, um, the viscosity of the blood starts flowing, continuously flowing, and the flows uh, become confused. Uh, there is also a contrary behavior, which is the reopactic behavior, which is given by, for example, a printer in never uh, shake uh, constantly a printer toner, uh, but if you did like that at a certain point and have it with those clothes and the um, that, that, that's why they are made in a way they work, you are not really able uh, to shake them. And they are set here to you know, because uh, um, because, uh, because in fact uh, the application of a, of a force or even a vibration constant for example the vibration is constant that, that's why the toner is kept very firm because if it were was vibrating as the printer does when it prints, for example, it would get the wire. Okay, um, so these are the rheological models in a little bit more, I would say, um, scientific than more than a narrative way. So basically, you have uh, shear stress. Which is expressed in uh, Pascal, and uh, then you have the uh, shear rate. So basically, the velocity of um, application of your force. So uh, you have the, the Newtonian behavior. The Newtonian behavior doesn't make any difference uh, what is the velocity of your force. There is always a constant linear dependence between shear stress and the shear rate, so the velocity of application. And then you have the plastic behavior. A, a plastic behavior, a material can be, well, these are, are models, of course. Uh, plastic means that you may need to reach the yield, like uh, I was mentioning for uh, toothpaste, for example, you have to reach the yield. Once you reach the yield, it starts. Flowing. For example, in a Newtonian way, um, not sure that all toothpaste are really Newtonian once you, once you uh, start to squeeze the, the, the tub. But, um, but in reality, um, this is a, a model which is useful to understand the, the, the main behaviors. Of course, uh, you, you can have also a for example, a, you can have a shear thickening or shear thinning. You might remember, as we were seeing in the previous slide, that shear thinning corresponds to pseudoplastic. So pseudoplastic means that the viscosity decreases when the velocity of application of the force increases. So faster force, easier flow. And um, this is in the model. 
also pseudo plastic uh, or uh, dinner pans. Um, and uh, you can have a combination of uh, the two uh, behaviors. So, for example, you can have shear thinning after some heal. For example, you have a heal which is, which is uh, uh, at, that point, at that point, one of the two points, or the higher point uh, that you see in the paper. And uh, you have this uh, shear thinning that starts. So it starts moving, but it's not Newtonian. Some plastics, uh, some plastics, some Bingham fluids are Newtonian after you exceed the yielding point, but this is not by no means the rule. In some cases, you might see shear thinning or even shear thickening um, after uh, plastic uh, yield. They are called plastic because they exceed the field and then they yield. So um, they start they start flowing, for example. Um, then there is another the other uh, difference between the uh, the two kind of uh, um, behavior, the two kind of opposite behavior, which was the fixotropic and rotation. So we have a constant velocity of flow and a constant flow thing of the path. Constant and the viscosity is gradually lower, therefore, we need a lower shear stress or lower flow. For the rotactic, it's the opposite, we um, keep a constant force and gradually we, we need a higher force. Uh, of course, uh, as you can see, with time everything tends a little bit to settle. The problem is that in some cases we don't have time. Um, in some cases the operation are made in, in, in within seconds. So uh, blood needs, new blood needs to come to the body in a matter of seconds to be extremely efficient. Um, and that's mainly the case for most operations of uh, material production etc. So in practical terms concrete has got a number of rheological behaviors. So it is tends to be plastic during transport but at a certain moment it flows. And when you apply a force, you apply a force to uh, to pour into a, into the mold. You pour the blood into the mold then it becomes pseudo plastic during the period of the setting. It tends to um, it tends to uh, flow better. But, uh, you are low to set the higher velocity. You apply a higher velocity and it's set, and it flows better. It feels the mold better. And uh, uh, when you shake it during the mixer, in the mixer, uh, therefore, you have this kind of fixotropic uh, behavior. Uh, not really a Newtonian behavior. If you have a text fixotropic behavior, it makes a difference. Um, when you shake uh, some time, after a while, it uh, starts, uh, the viscosity is. Uh, is reduced, so you apply a constant velocity, which is the rotation of your mixer, and after after a while, it um, starts flowing. It's uh, don't be confused about being plastic. Plastic behavior means that I apply it once the force and it keeps shaking. The, uh, uh, in uh, in this case, uh, I need to apply a cyclic force, like in fatigue, up and down, up and down, or rotating cycles. And after some time, it starts, the viscosity decreases and it starts flowing. Okay, I think we uh, have completed that. And uh, next time, which is going to be on uh, Friday at 11, we are going to complete our uh, question uh, about uh, which is necessarily uh, the uh, lesson. Um, because uh, um, the, uh, 
we are going to start with the, with the material which was uh, substituted with concrete, which is uh, wood. Which is uh, an example of natural materials. Uh, I hope to be able to talk a little bit about this in the last uh, few years, uh, which are reviving. Um, for now, um, I hope you enjoyed and see you on the